Hello. Hello, please. Yeah, what's the problem, sir? Um, we've just closed down our farm track. Yeah. So, and, uh, feed our pheasants. We've come across a Range Rover with three people in it. Yeah. It appears that they're dead. I don't know what's happening. Blood in the motor all over them. back to a new video on the Essex Boys case. As always, if you are enjoying the content, please do give the video a thumbs up. And if you're interested in the Essex Boys case, or simply true crime in general, don't forget to hit the subscribe button below. A mystery drug syndicate may have ordered the triple Rettenden murders the Old Bailey heard. Their target was possibly Pat Tate, who double-crossed them over a cocaine deal, claimed defence lawyer David Lederman QC. He said the syndicate hired a professional hitman to execute 37-year-old Tate and two other drug barons. Mr Lederman added that Tate, a gangster with a long prison record, had many enemies. He had already survived one shooting at his home in Gordon Road, Basildon, where he recovered in hospital. Mr Lederman claimed that Tate had upset the syndicate for not handing over their full share from a cocaine deal worth thousands of pounds. The barrister also claimed that Supergrass Darren Nichols, 32, was possibly involved in the syndicate and knew Tate from their days in jail. Nichols admitted to being the getaway driver but said he knew nothing of the killings. He alleged they were ruthlessly carried out by Jack Wombs, 36, and 55-year-old Michael Steele. Mr Lederman, who represents Wombs, accused Nichols of being a liar and said he became the prosecution star witness to save his own skin. He added, Nichols had something to do with these killings. What it is, we will probably never know. And what his involvement was with this syndicate, we shall never know. Mr Lederman insisted there was no forensic evidence to link Wombs and Steele with the heartless shootings in December 1995. Nichols has said that Wombs, a hefty former nightclub bouncer, had worn size 12 Wellington boots at the murder scene. There were no such footprints to match that description, added Mr Lederman. Also, the alleged getaway car, a VW Passat, was checked out by police scientists. They could not find any bloodstains inside the vehicle. The car, described as something of a heap, had four different makes of tyres, but none of them showed up at the snow-covered scene in Workhouse Lane, Rettenden. Mr Lederman, who was into the third day of his closing speech, commented, quote, It is extraordinary that not one piece of evidence, let alone a combination of evidence, was found at the murder scene to connect the two defendants. The scene does not support the Crown's case and there is no evidence to confirm the account put forward by Nichols. Wombs of Main Road, Brockford, Suffolk and Steele of St Mary's Road, Great Bentley, Essex deny murder and drug smuggling. The two men who died with Tate were Tony Tucker, 38, of High Road Fobbing, and Craig Rolfe, 26, of Calshot Avenue, Chafford 100. The trial continues. The following article is from the 8th of December, 1995, with the headline, Gangland Clue to Men Shot Dead in Range Rover. Three men were shot in the head as they sat in a car after apparently being lured to a remote farm track in Essex. The men, thought to be criminals, were found shortly before 8am yesterday. A farmer and his friend were going to feed their pheasants at White House Farm Rettenden near Chelmsford when they discovered the blue seven-year-old Range Rover with the men slumped inside. The identities of the men, all believed to come from South Essex and details of their previous convictions, were not disclosed. Detective Superintendent Ivan Dibley, who is leading the investigation into what is believed to be a gangland killing, said, It was not an ordinary murder. It appears that they were enticed to go down the lane, or an arrangement was made for them to be there. Shotgun cartridges were found in the snow near the car, which was parked 250 yards down Workhouse Lane. The track runs from the main south end to Chelmsford Road to a private fishing lake. Police believe that the men were shot at point-blank range in the car. The murderer, possibly with an accomplice, is then understood to have driven away. We don't know if we are looking for one perpetrator or two, Mr Dibley said. We also don't know whether somebody arrived in the same vehicle as the victims or came in their own. 
The track, in which a hijacked lorry was dumped several years ago, was so narrow that the police were unable to take the bodies from the Range Rover to carry out a post-mortem examination. Instead, the men, all white and aged between 20 and 40, were left inside the car. The vehicle was covered with a green tarpaulin and taken to South Woodham Ferrers for examination six hours after the bodies were found. Peter Theobald, the farmer who found the bodies, and his friend Ken Jiggins, a bricklayer, thought that the Range Rover belonged to fishermen when they saw it blocking the track. We were driving down the farm track to feed the birds, Mr Jiggins, 44, said. The Range Rover was parked close to a locked gate which leads to the lake. We thought that perhaps it was a fisherman, but they all have their own keys. I got out, walked up to the Range Rover and tapped on the window and told them to move it. There was no response. I looked in and then walked back to Peter and told him that there were two people in there who, by the looks of it, had been shot dead. Peter then got out of the car, walked up to the vehicle. He looked in and said, there's one in the back as well. We got hold of the police and told them what we had seen. People living nearby said they heard nothing on Wednesday night or early yesterday morning. Ron Foe, owner of Rettenden Hall, said, quote, We are shooting people. It would not be unusual to hear guns at night. People go lamping for rabbits and foxes. We are into shotguns, but we heard nothing. The following article comes from the 21st of January 1998 with the headline, Lured to their doom. For Peter Theobald and Kenneth Jiggins, it started as a routine early morning drive to feed pheasants in the snow in the Essex countryside. But as the pair turned their vehicle up Workhouse Lane, an isolated farm track just off the main Chelmsford to South End Road, they got their first inkling that something was wrong. Blocking the padlocked gate at the end of the track was a metallic blue Range Rover that shouldn't have been there. Cursing, Mr Jiggins braved the coal to get the vehicle shifted. As he walked up to the Range Rover, he could see there were people inside. But there was no response to his tapping. He began to think they were asleep, but then saw blood on the faces and realised they were dead. Things moved quickly after that. The emergency services descended on the scene in force and within hours the names of the three dead men were known. Craig Rolfe, Pat Tate and Tony Tucker. All were from South Essex, all had been blasted with a shotgun at close range and all were known criminals with connections with the drugs underworld. A massive manhunt was launched with no shortage of suspects. But true to the criminal code of silence, nobody was giving anything away. Except one man. Former small-time drug dealer and petty criminal Darren Nichols turned supergrass after police started to investigate his links with the triple killing. Getaway driver Nichols, who now has a new identity and a new life with police protection, led detectives to two men. Engineer Michael Steele, 55, and 36-year-old Jack Wombs were questioned and later charged with the killing of the three men. Steele of St Mary's Road, Angers Green, Great Bentley, and Wombs of Main Road, Brockford, Suffolk, both denied the charges. In court, they produced alibis and accused Nichols of fabricating the story to deflect attention away from his own involvement in the slayings. Security was tight with armed police surrounding Chelmsford Magistrates Court as the pair appeared in the dock for the first time. Then, on September the 2nd last year, the trial began at the Old Bailey and became one of the longest and most expensive criminal trials ever. During the months of questioning and cross-questioning, the patient and long-suffering jury of eight women and four men listened as Supergrass Nichols relayed his version of events. The background to the assassinations was outlined to the court by Andrew Monday QC at the start of the trial. Tate had apparently threatened to kill Steele when he believed he was not properly compensated for substandard cannabis the court heard. But Steele and Wombs decided they would eliminate the threat once and for all. They planned the triple killing to take place on a cold and snowy December night. Tate and his associates were lured to the scene on the promise of a new and substantial deal, this time in cocaine. As they relaxed in their Range Rover, eight shots were fired rapidly into their heads from close range. But what prompted such terrible acts? The answer, it would appear, was a dispute over a consignment of very poor quality cannabis. Dealing in drugs is not an honourable trade. 
It is often the province of the double cross, the sting and the double deal. After the shootings, Steele said he felt a bit like the angel of death. He had done everyone a favour and got rid of the sort of people you would not want around, said Mr Monday. Steele and Wombs were convicted after Nichols described picking them up after the murders. He said he heard Wombs laughing as he recalled how his partner's gun had fallen apart during the shootings. He said Steele would describe Wombs as a cold-hearted bastard who had pointed his gun into the Range Rover and put shots into all three immediately. Nichols said he drove Wombs to the scene thinking it was simply for a drug deal meeting. He was told to wait nearby until he was called. When he returned and the front door of the car opened, Nichols states, quote, The light came on. I saw Jack's hands. He was wearing surgical-type gloves. They were covered in speckles of something which I could see was red, he added. He took it to be blood, and then he realised what was going on. If you would like to learn more about the Range Rover murders, then click on the video in front of you now. You will also see the Essex Boys playlist, which has all of the videos concerning this case in one convenient folder. Many thanks for joining me for this video. I look forward to seeing you all again for the next one. Take care. Cheers.